This business is like the Wild West. Gold, silver, rare coins, lost treasures of history. You never know what's gonna walk through that door. Bullets from the Civil War era. Hideous and creepy and I bet somebody will like them. This is a home run item right here. I'm Evan Kale and this is Pawn Man. Guys, we have a great episode of Pawn Man in store. Before we get into it, I want to thank our episode sponsor, Lady Liberty Tattoo and Lady Liberty Bullion. It's the same person. Lady Liberty Tattoo is a tattoo parlor in St. Paul Park, Minnesota, and they are also Lady Liberty Bullion. They do custom pours, which you can find on my Whatnot Auctions. They pretty much only sell through me. But I'll tell you, if you guys want a kick-ass tattoo, go check out Lady Liberty Tattoo in St. Paul Park here in Minnesota. I don't have any tattoos, but I do know some people that have gotten tattoos from Lady Liberty Tattoo, and CM is the person's name who owns it. He is an excellent tattoo artist. So if you want a kick-ass tattoo, visit Lady Liberty Tattoo, or follow them on social media, or again, Lady Liberty Bullion. There is a link in the video description. With that, let's get into a great video. We're running trains on a bitch. You'll see. Evan made a new lady friend. Evan likes her. So she's got a lot of cool antiques and stuff and like, you know, the joy of hanging out with Evan, if you got valuable shit, well, right here, I'll go through it for you. You're my friend. You on the internet, I don't want to do that. Time's money, but with friends or if I'm hanging with people, it's like, well, I may as well make myself useful while I'm in your home. So she first showed me all of her coins and nothing too special. But then she showed me a train set, which we will talk about in the monologue. That's what we're covering this week. And then when she also said, are swords valuable? I'm like, oh, you got a sword? Oh, I like swords, let me see. So let me show you the sword. This is an M1840 Wrist Breaker Cavalry Saber. This was made by a German company, Clement and & Jung, and it was imported by the Union for use during the Civil War. Now what's unfortunate about this, as we talk about with antiques, it's all gotta be original. I don't know enough, cause I'm not, as much as I like swords, I'm not an expert. At least not in styles like this. I think this is done after the fact. The original handle looks like it's probably been stripped off from wear. Overall though, this is in great shape. This is, I think, brass here. I can see why they call it a wrist breaker. Now, a sword like this, scabbard and all. Oh, I bet it's worth three, 400 bucks probably. We talked about Civil War antiques. If you haven't seen the episode, please check it out. It is one of my favorite subjects, but when she brought this out, I was like, oh, you actually have like a good sword, cool. And when I say good sword, I mean, most of these swords are so beat up. So one, if you're gonna buy a sword, make sure it does come with the scabbard and make sure the scabbard is original. This is original. If you're not sure, look at the material, look at the wear. We see authentic rust. I did some research, this is all the proper material. If a material doesn't line up, it's a reproduction or the whole thing is fake. The blade itself could be restored just due to the fact that this sword is not that expensive, just a couple hundred dollars. For an enthusiast, it might be worth cleaning up. It might be worth making it shiny again. Personally, because this has nicks in it, like we see right here, and then you'll notice the tip is actually kind of dull. This is a battle sword that was definitely used. And just knowing what I know about swords, these were probably defensive marks, meaning somebody swung at the soldier. This was probably their attempt at the first kill shot and then the second. So these are some vintage trains from my lady friend Pam. She's letting me borrow these too. These were her dad's. These are probably from the 1960s if I had to guess. What's cool is they come with like the original brochure. And if you're a true collector, you want all the literature too. That's part of a complete set is you have the cars, you have the boxes, you have the literature, everything. In this case, I think she just has the literature. These vintage posters talking about how to set it up. Now I'm not gonna set this up. I just, uh, I, I told her I'd be careful with it and I don't wanna fuck with it. We did a little research last night when I was over there. This one's cheap. This one's like six bucks. This one's cheap, South Pacific. This New York car here, this is worth about a hundred bucks. So this is a better antique or a better collectible, higher price point. It's in great shape too. So something like this is where you begin to start spending money in this field. Uh, all piece dollars, 20 of them. All kind of the same date, 22, 23. Looks like extra fine cleans. Okay, this one's a little better. So that's 1985. Yeah. Oh, let's go. I think I have enough cash. Okay, so we bought 60 piece dollars. Median price, I'll bet I'll get about 34 bucks. I'll make about $300 on that deal. The GSA here, um, I paid them 300, I rounded up. I'll get probably about 350, so. I make about 350 bucks on that, not bad. 
It's gonna be on uh, a Whatnot auction. What's Whatnot? It's TikTok meets eBay. If you don't have it, download it with the code in my profile. You'll get a free $15 off your first purchase. Live streaming auctions, a lot of fun. I'm on there a few nights a week. Link in the bio, check it out. So I'm kind of an old person. I listen to the news like all the time. So on BBC uh, the other week, I heard a very interesting story and it's it kind of answered a question that I never, I guess I could have just easily looked it up, but I just kind of always thought. So one of our rules is, and I learned this from the old man, don't buy computer parts because they say there's computer, there's gold and precious metals in computers, but it's such a negligible small amount. There ain't nothing there and a lot of it's plated anyway. So how much gold do you think is in this computer? Roughly 3% of a gram three to five-ish dollars worth of gold. Now, computers, electronics, gets thrown out, fills up landfills, and there's a lot of precious metal if you add up macro, all the shit that gets thrown out every year. The Royal Mint out of the UK, which makes the United Kingdom's bullion, has set up a new processing plant to strictly deal with electronics, mainly computers, and siphon out the gold and turn them into commemorative coins. They're planning on processing upwards of 4,000 tons of gold every year from stuff that would just be getting thrown out and turning that into commemorative coins. They're estimating globally, there's 2.6 million tons of e-waste every year, just stuff that's getting thrown out. So it's being repurposed. I mean, it is going into commemorative coins, but at least it's being salvaged because here on earth, although there's a lot of gold and I don't think we're gonna run out, it is a finite resource. And this is just a way to keep stuff that's falling through the cracks and turn it into something that preserves it. In 2022, to give you a dollar amount, 11 billion pounds of gold, precious metals were wasted through e-waste. That translates to 14 and a half billion dollars. That was in 2022. So just think about that on a macro scale, how much is being wasted. Right now, this stuff is being used to make jewelry, but like I said, they're gonna instead turn it into pure commemorative coins. What they do is they stick this circuit board through an oven and they extract through heat these very, very, very tiny amounts of gold. But again, it's better than just throwing it away and having the whole thing set in the earth. So I heard that on BBC News and I thought that was interesting. And I'm curious to see what kind of commemoratives they're gonna make out of it. If they're gonna do something like specifically some kind of like an electronic or computer commemoration or if it's just gonna have King Pedophile on it and that's it. Glory to colonialism. On a positive note, beyond that one. So I, he uh, told me it was a thousand dollar ring. 14 carat. I don't know nothing about gold. All I had was 40 bucks on I me. Mean, that's all I had. 60 bucks a game on this one. So this is a famous scam. Uh, is, it, is it real though? No. It's not real? I will put acid on it to be sure. He's got a fancy watch on and he's got, and, and I, shucks, I'm so rich. Your, my loss is your gain. Oh, I'm just having a bad day. So I'm gonna, cause I'm so rich, money doesn't matter to me. So I'm gonna give you thousands of dollars of jewelry. Just give me what you got. Yeah, no, he's got a truck full of it. They go, they go state to state. So watch this. This is the market we just made here. We got the acid and this appears. It is not genuine. All right, so, well one, just kind of looking at this thing too, I could tell that that's not, uh, they don't make a maple that looks like that, but at least it was only 40. Kuma Lamor, if you ever see it again, call the police right away. Oh, wow, man. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry that happened to you. I wasn't going to do the, record the deal. I'm in a mood today, but I, uh, as soon as I started hearing it, I thought, oh, well, here we go. Here's another great reminder. It's the same scam. We've seen it again and again. My friend's dad, like, just got taken for it. And you guys, use common sense. Does somebody who's super rich really not have a credit card? Well, shucks, they're just out of gas money. Gosh darn it. But all they need is a, is a quick 40 bucks and, and you can have this ring that's worth a thousand because I'm so rich it doesn't. No, please, you guys, please use common sense. If you encounter this, call the police right away. This person is running a scam. You're not, ca you're not catching that one person where this is happening to. This is a known scam. Well, again, it, unfortunately, their expense, uh, we have learned, a, again, a valuable lesson. I was going through a scrap pile and I found this. Let's talk about what this is. It's a vintage dancing purse. And of course my ACAM is out of batteries. This is a vintage dancing purse, like I said, and my grandma actually used to have something kind of like this too. In fact, I remember I put it in my mouth cause you know, I was like a little kid and it's that silver's got like a taste to it and almost got like a smell to it too. 
Almost, anyway. I believe this one here is sterling silver. They can be plated, uh, they can be leather. And these are designed for women to carry around all their essentials when they would go out on an evening of leisure. They were functional and fashionable. Their height of popularity was like 1920s, 30s era. The very early ones from the early 20th century were made from things like silk or satan. It was very symbolic of the art deco movement of the times. And in the 1920s, 30s, into the 40s, they started making them like this, made from precious metal oftentimes with more structure, more intricacy. They would hold things for more functionality like we see here. The mirror folds back so you can put some makeup here. It's got little coin slots. You can have coins. It's got an attaching uh, clip here for your money. And in the 1950s, they started really incorporating a lot of gemstones and you know, rhinestones, pearls, that sort of thing. I would guess this one here is from the 30s or the 40s. They have waned in popularity and in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, they became cheaper. They became more simplistic. The style of them kind of started to fade out. I don't think you'd find somebody, even though this is a nice vintage piece, I don't think you'd find at least a young person walking around with something like this, especially because this part's functional for a lot of, re for a lot of reasons that I don't know anything about. But overall, you're not gonna really, you can't do much. This can hold maybe 10 coins each and like things are expensive. It's good for money. But the style of these has waned. Like I said, I found this in my melt pile. I will probably try to sell this on my whatnot auction. I like to preserve this kind of stuff, but if I can't find a buyer for this, within 30 days, and by the time you guys are watching this, this is either long scrapped or I did sell it. I don't know, I'll throw it on my whatnot auction for a pinch over melt. If it doesn't sell, I'll just throw it on the scrapper. Cause these are, they're not rare. I do see these every now and again, but they are cool. And I've never talked about exactly what they are. So that is a little history on dancing purses. All right, so full collection of Morgan, some common dates, MS-62, MS-63, 81, oh, MS-62, 1878, seven. It's probably the rarest, I would say. 1878, seven tail feather reverse of 78. Like I said, the market right now sucks for rare coins. I'd be at like 1650 on all of them. Yeah, I know. Okay, what was your highest bid? Over two grand. Oh, let somebody else deal with that then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. somebody else I think is making a mistake. I think he was bluffing. I don't think anyone offered him over 2,000. That's full retail on that set. Full gray sheet was about $2,500. And I just, I know the other dealers. I know what they pay. Gray sheet is the standardized catalog for coin pricing. I, I'm a member of it. If you're a dealer, I recommend being a member. If you trade in coins, I recommend being a member, but just know these prices that they're printing, the coins are worth, and they're not bogus prices. It's just no one's paying them. I would have made about $400 on that deal if he would have said yes, which is not a huge margin. He didn't have any super expensive dates. His best coin, he had an 1878 seven tail feather reverse of 78. That coin full, full value is worth about 225. I would have probably gotten just with this market, maybe 150 on it. So, you know, like I said, like if somebody else is making a better offer, I think they're making a mistake. And if you guys don't have, like if you have rare coins right now, this is not the time to sell them. Keep them, buy them, cause you can get some great deals, but don't sell them. Cause you're not gonna be getting what stuff is worth. Every dealer right now, every dealer that I know, and that's how I know he was full of shit. They're not even paying most of them 40 cents on the dollar on gray sheet bed, truly. So that's my advice is keep your coins and hang on to them and wait for the market to recover. He's a creepy old man in a windowless van. Who wants to babysit the communist can? Well, that isn't America's favorite pedophile. I'm gonna tell you guys right now, I actually, I don't wanna buy a fucking thing from him. We have pretty much shut down our eBay. I mean, not completely, but we're just like not listing shit on there anymore. This is all for content. Like that's the only reason why I told, I want him in here so I can make fun of him. Get down over here too, we're to dripping and hurt yourself. Oh, oh yeah, looking spiffy, right? You think of it once a week. Yeah, you're looking good too. <laughs> Look like uh, you belong in the Hamptons at a white party. <laughs> I do, you, buddy. Huh? What about P. Diddy? What? 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 <laughs> <laughs> Get Smart, the complete series on VHS. And you brought me a clock. Brand new. You, you brought me a clock. I'm good on a clock. Brand new. As I say, you bring me some CDs. You got some P. Diddy music in here. They're just burned CDs. I actually think this is a crime to sell me these. <laughs> I, no, I'm not kidding. This is actually, I think this is copyright infringement if you sell me these, because these are just burned CDs and you don't own the rights to these. Dude, it on the I don't clock. want I don't want to buy an alarm clock, especially if it's a gift. No. I, I just I also just like don't want to buy an alarm clock. Please buy it. No. I give you five bucks. Forget smart. Maybe you give me ten, huh? 
I don't want to give you ten. I'm not gonna make any money. I'll give you. I'll give you six. You're gonna give me ten. Now I'll give you six because it's an inflationary offer and it's an inflation economy. But that's as high as I'm going. I don't want to buy this. I'm doing you a favor by taking it off your hands. That's all. That's all to say. All right. You wanna grab the man six dollars or Abraham Lincoln and uh, uh, George Washington? Of course. <laughs> we have our ticket ratio admission. So here I also got this for you. This will get you into a white party in the Hamptons. Thanks for everything. Absolutely. You be well. Oh. Yeah, I'm not kidding you guys. You can't sell you can't sell music. It's, it's like a burned CD. That's called uh, stealing somebody's music and selling it when you don't have the rights to it. I would have thought he would have known better on that because he's not an idiot. He also he gave me a weird look like I've never seen before. I can't put it into words because I, I I like I actually won't put him on camera for his own safety because I'm sure people do crazy shit to him. But he looked at me with eyes that were quite menacing. Like I've never seen before. He gave me this look and I was like, oh God. There we go, the mask is off. Now I see what's going on there. Get smart, I saw on eBay for 25 bucks used. So, sure, I'm not really doing shit on eBay. I just wanted to make fun of them. <laughs> All right guys, for this week, we are talking about a subject that I honestly have been putting off for a while because it doesn't interest me, but it might interest some of you. And it is really important to the field of collectibles as a whole and antiques. And that field is running trains on a bitch. No, we're talking about model trains. It is a really expensive and important staple of hobbyism, of hobbyists, of collectibles, and it's something that I have never really had an interest in because I have only been on a train once in my life, and it was actually pretty fun. I was going out to a party in Fire Island, and we got really drunk on the train. It wasn't Amtrak. It was pretty fun. But like trains, we never took trains when I was growing up. I never have been into trains, but a lot of people are into trains, and this is a hobby that can get really expensive. Now, personally, when I think of model trains, one, I think of boomers. Like this, again, just seems like a boomer hobby through and through. But two, I'm a huge fan of The Sopranos. It is my all-time favorite show. And the character Bobby got way into model trains uh, toward the end of the series. And I just always think about him and his obsession with trains, particularly with, uh... well, watch the show. This has been something for hobbyists, collectors, and enthusiasts for over a century. First toy trains appeared in Europe in the early 1800s. Typically these trains were made from wood or metal and they were push-pull toys and then a wind-up feature would come in to add more locomotion, pun intended. There was a very limited capacity with the technology to get these items to move. You really just had to sit there and kind of go choo-choo and push along. Germany became the hub for creating these toys with toy makers Bing and Marklin leading the way and continuing to lead the way to this day. In the late 1800s, we got clockwork wind-up toy trains which changed the whole field for enthusiasts because now you don't have to sit there and physically push it yourself. You can wind it up and enjoy watching it move on its own. And Marklin, which came about in 1959, is credited as having the first wind-up model trains out there on the market. German manufacturers had detailed hand designs. The craftsmanship was high quality. They were the leading staple of model trains, and like I said, they still are to this day. And as this hobby and interest grew, so too did the technology that was driving it, trains themselves, a huge, huge part of industry, of transportation, of the entire world in the 1800s, right when this was really starting to take off, trains were all the rage because they were probably one of the most useful inventions of the 19th century. Now in 1891, Marklin again changed the whole game of model trains with the first electric train. They also introduced the first standardized scale of track, of scale of a trains. You know, you'll look, if you buy a model kit, you might see it's a one one thousandth model. This was perfected by Marklin, and also at the same time, they released these electric model trains onto the market, and now you can really enjoy these trains because instead of having to wind up and wait for the momentum to, to die out for the train to slow down and stop, you can sit and watch it for hours. In 1900, Joshua Lionel Cowan, he invented Lionel Toys, and I'm sure you've heard of that name. Even I've heard of that name, and I'm not really a hobbyist much, or like, I don't really do like toys like this, and I know the name Lionel. I'm sure so many of you do as well. And he was the first major American maker of model trains. His trains ran on a three rail track system and it was powered by a transformer. So it's getting even more complex with the electricity, with the hobby, with the intricacy, with being able to play with your train sets, watch your train sets move on their own, and also just have more complex settings for your trains to move through. Lionel standard gauge trains became an instant hit in the United States. And they were again known for their detail, their complexity, their reliability, their large scale, and their durability as well. Now the alternating current sets were actually kind of dangerous. And so they, in the 1920s, had to change the design to make them safer for the public because accidents were happening. In 1925, Lionel introduced a direct current lower voltage set, and it was 
Again, a bigger hit because it was safer, it was more reliable. What's interesting is these sets were similar to the trains of the New York City subway system. That was kind of the inspiration. So not only is it more to scale and more reliable, it's taking more from the actual item, the actual thing itself, and miniaturizing it onto the smaller track, making it a better product. That's just very ironic and interesting to me. Now, the golden age of model trains runs from the 1920s to the 1950s. Makers such as Lionel, American Flyer, and Marks enjoyed significant growth. Products became increasingly sophisticated with detailed landscape sets, more detailed tracks, the kinds of trains that you could get were more intricate, realistic sound effects, working lights, smoke. I mean, you could really transform yourself to whatever era of train you wanted to build and enjoy that timepiece as you sat and watched. World War II and post-World War II also had a big impact, and this is why the Golden Age happened. You have suburbia, you have the establishment of the middle class, you have disposable income for the middle class, and you have the ability to buy things for your family, you know, just to amuse them, just so the kids have something to do so, you know, we can all sit down and have fun as a family. Like, you know, board games are really starting to take off in this time too, because people, again, had spare money. The American economy was really expanding. And as the years shift and as technology continues to get better, so too the detail, the scale, what you're getting, the effort that's being put in, the ability to recreate something life-size in your basement, it just improves more and more each year. You also have the standardized HO scale. That is a 187 scale. This is ultra also introduced during this golden age. And even with like, uh, I got a mobile suit Gundam. This is my uh, camphor. This is my favorite mobile suit from Gundam 0080. You know, this is a 187th scale. It is a really standardized scale, the 187th. You see it a lot when you go to hobby stores. The HO scale became kind of a standard for miniaturized models. And the scale is so important because it offers a balance between detail and size. We also have advanced coupling systems, more realistic sounds, more realistic engines. The Again, the electricity is just continuing to improve every year. And you have the rise of model train clubs, exhibitions, train shows, publications. This, this hobby becomes cemented as a staple for families and enthusiasts alike. Also, in the post-war years, you have the rise of plastic. And plastic allows the hobby to be enjoyed at a much cheaper scale because plastic is a lot easier to manufacture and produce. It's not quite as good of a set as something that's made from metal or wood or something like that, but you now have the ability to mass produce these trains at a cheaper cost and allow people that are interested in getting into this hobby a means to do so without the higher price point. However, into the 1960s and 70s, this is where we start to see a decline in the interest of model trains and that's due to the rise of technology electronic technology, particularly the advent of video games. Lionel and other manufacturers face financial challenges but continue to innovate during this time period. The 1 160th scale also came out in this time period and this was a way for them to, again, manufacture products at a cheaper price point and allow consumers a cheaper entry point into the market to continue enjoying the hobby or to enter into it at a cheaper price point. Train sets also start to now integrate remote controls, which advanced the hobby even more and made it more realistic. And into the end of the century, in the 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s, we have digital advancements entering the field as well, which allow for, again, even more technological changes for the hobby. There's a number of different scales. There's the G scale, which is a one to 22 and a half scale. These are used for garden railways. As you can imagine, these are big. These are not gonna fit on your house. These are primarily used for outdoors. The O scale, which is a 1 to 48 scale. These are large and durable. These are popularized by Lionel. We have the most common scale, the HO scale, the 187th. There's the N scale, which is the 1 160th. And then there's the Z scale, the smallest scale, 1 220th. These are tiny. Now, when talking about collecting these, one thing to keep in mind, scale versus gauge. Scale refers to the proportionized size of the model versus the realistic size. Well, gauge refers to the distance between the rails and depending on what you get, this can influence the price and collectability of your model. Also, if you're buying model trains from World War II, look for materials that were scarce. Many model trains were completely halted because of the war effort and they needed the materials for the war effort. So if you see war effort materials in a train from say 1943, that's probably pretty rare and that can have a massive impact on price. You're gonna be of course, like with any collectible, looking at rarity, looking at year, looking at materials in, 
Is it a rare model? Is it a more common model? Does it work? Is it all the original parts? Really pre-World War II models are what collectors are gonna be going after. This is where your price point gets higher versus modern pieces, you know, stuff produced today. What brand is it? Is it in the original packaging? Have you opened it? Some of these trains, you can have them open, taken out, you can have played with them. It's not gonna hurt the value that much. Other ones, make sure you don't take them out of the box. Uh, very much like with other toy collectibles. Lionel's pre-war and post-war O-gauge models tend to be some of the most expensive ones on the market from the research that I found. And Marklin tin plate trains also can be very expensive too. Now, what is tin plate? This is a process where steel is coated with tin to prevent rusting. Many early 20th century models were made from this and they can be very rare and sought after. Most people that are collecting are gonna be focusing on a specific theme. Example, you might want Wild West. You might want, uh, I don't know, some time period in Europe that you're interested in. If you're going to be getting into this hobby, you need to consider one, the price point. How much are you going to spend? Uh, these sets can be thousands of dollars. If you want a really, really good set, you're looking at maybe spending five, 10 grand. You need to consider, are you gonna be building a theme? Do you not care? Do you wanna invest in scenery? The scenery can get very expensive. You also need to consider, where am I storing these trains? You want a dry climate controlled space. You don't want to damp. It can ruin your set, everything from the electricity, to the wood, if you have wooden train, I mean, your stuff can get ruined really easily if you don't have an environmentally controlled set. Really to drive home what you need though for getting into this, you need to choose your scale. You can't be you can't be shifting scales. Once you have a scale, you really are stuck with it. You need to focus on your collection, your theme, what kinds of models, your price point, you need to have a budget. Do your damn research. Don't just watch this video and get into it. Watch a lot of videos, talk to enthusiasts, talk to hobbyists, and make a strict budget and know what you're getting into before you start buying stuff. And then really quickly, here are 10 of the most, or some of the most expensive model train sets that sold at auction. This is, you know, how I always like to end these that I found. A Marklin zero gauge tin plate train set sold in 2014 at auction for $60,000. The Hornby Dublo Silver King was $70,000. Then in 2015 for $77,000, the Bing zero gauge locomotive. Number seven, a Marklin gauge one crocodile. $80,000. And the Crocodile is one of Marklin's most famous models. Above that for $90,000, again, a Marklin zero gauge train set which sold in 2012. It was from 1925. A Lionel 1937 Brute for $105,000. For $121,000, there is a brass custom built train set. It had an art deco design. It was a pretty unique piece. A lot of these custom ones, it's kind of a crapshoot, but this one was so unique and it was in such good shape. It commanded a huge price at auction. Then the Marklin one gauge prototype, $130,000. And if you find a prototype, that's I think kind of a no brainer. And the top two were both from Lionel. Number two for $150,000, the Lionel Blue Comet train set. And the most expensive one I found went for a quarter million dollars. It was made in 1934 by Lionel's founder himself. It was a one of a kind set. So just keep in mind, you guys, this can this hobby has a lot of room. Uh, it has a lot of room to grow. Can still it declined for a while. It is kind of coming back. This is a hobby. It is over 200 years old and it is not going anywhere anytime soon. Trains remain a staple of human history, of locomotion, of transportation, and really it's it's a hobby for those who appreciate history, appreciate models, craftsmanship, and really just want to have a reserved good time, in my opinion. And that's the magic of running trains on the weekend in your basement. Just remember, you gotta grease up and lube those wheels before you stick a big oversized load into a tiny little hole. As for model trains, I can't really help you, but for running trains, oh, Pawn Man's got some advice. All right, guys, well, that'll do it for this episode of Pawn Man. Once again, if you want to become an episode sponsor, please reach out and let me know. I want to thank our episode sponsor for this episode, Lady Liberty Bullion slash Lady Liberty Tattoo, located in St. Paul Park, Minnesota. There is a link in the video description. If you are in Minnesota and you want to get a kick-ass tattoo from an excellent artist, check out CM Shop. Lady Liberty Tattoo again in St. Paul Park. Again, there's a link in the video description. If you guys want to shop with me, check out the Pawn Man Bullion Club. Get yourself some precious metals if you've never done it. Consider buying a couple ounces of silver, maybe a small amount of gold if you're just kind of getting your feet wet in it. I do have the best prices on the internet at pawnmanstore.com. Also get my books, follow me on social media at pawnman. Post your questions in the comment section so I can answer them in the next episode of Between the Pawn. And with that, you guys, 
I will see you for another great episode. Later.